Welcome to the shop. It's great to have you again. Tonight's project is actually something to complement the camera lady's amazing gifts. And one of her amazing gifts is <laughs> making unbelievable famous pizza. It's uh, when you eat over our house, sometimes you may be lucky enough to get that famous pizza. And um, we've always served it and actually baked it on these wire mesh discs. I meant to bring one out, but uh, they're 16 inches in diameter. And we would quite often put those on the table on some type of riser um, or a trivet or something like that. But you know, it was it's okay, but it's not really justifying the presentation does not justify the pizza. So thought, hey, let's make a pizza. It's like a pizza peel. It's like you've seen the big pizza makers. They have like a flat, long stick, and they have the flat, thin metal that slides under the pizza, and they move them around so skillfully, and then bring them out and throw them on the counter and chop them up. Well, I thought of making that maybe another time when we get an actual pizza oven. But I wanted to make something that resembled a pizza peel, but without the, the uh, sharply beveled front edge, which acts as the, the spatula. So this is a, a pizza cutter. We wanted something to cut the pizza on and then to serve it and look nice. So we need a dimension of 18 inches wide. The camera lady's pizza is to run 16 inch diameter. So we want a good inch all around. And then we decided we wanted like a handle, not, it doesn't need to be a long handle, just a handle that you can serve it and onto the, the dining table, pick it up more easily. And also, um, we want to make sure that this peel stays flat. Now, I didn't want it to be super thick. I, I'm just imagining something that resembles the peel in thinness, but not quite that thin, not just this big chunky thing. I don't want it to be too heavy either. So it's got to be moderately thin and hard enough and stay flat. So you got to choose your wood carefully. And I'm going to choose, rather than a soft wood like pine, we want something with a hardness to it. Now, we could use something like white oak or, or even hard maple. That wouldn't be a bad choice. Um, I just didn't have any hanging around. So my choice is basically dictated by the chunks I had in my pile. And your choice may be as well, if you want to make one of these things. Um, but I settled on the flame birch, because it had a nice chunk of it that was six inches wide. It was two inches thick. It was in the rough. It was actually about two and an eighth in the rough. So I, I ended up getting a full two inches wide of it. But um, anyway, so it was six, eight quarter, two inches thick, and uh, right about 60 inches long. So I had five board feet in that. So, and I actually am able to get three serving trays out of that, which are perfect, because that's what the camera lady would like. Because when we have a crowd, she's like, they're flying out of the oven. Now I want to show you some other choices. like. Um, the main thing you want to do is when you choose your material, the, the six inch width was important to see that I had plain sawn grain here. Now this is a piece of white oak. It's already been dressed down to an inch and five eighths. This is left over from chair making at some point. Um, but I'm showing you this, like imagine if this were rough, just like that um, flame birch piece and it was only six inches wide instead of a good eight or nine right here. But if it was only six inches wide, that's what I had, but I had two inches thick and it was plain sawn like this. So if I can cut this into strips, like resaw it in this dimension on the bandsaw and get a bunch of thinner pieces and then lay them on their side, now I'm gonna have an entire pizza serving tray, quarter sawn. So all the grain is going to be running vertically 
through those thin pieces. So every piece will end up being laid down like this. And if you could slip those to the side, you'd have all very nice tight linear grain on the face of your, your serving tray. So that's what I want to do. I want that primarily because when you have grain running this way, and I know some of you already know what I'm going to say here, um, it's extremely stable. The material is very stable because wood, ten, wood moves along the growth rings. Okay, so this, all trees are contracting in the winter and expanding in the summer, really along the growth rings. So this wood will grow like that and like that. And if it was dead wet, it would shrink along the rings so it actually would end up cupping this way because those rings are pulling together, almost like rubber bands, and it cups. So that's where you have your movement. So imagine now, if you slice this this way, and then we flip them all up, now each piece is only moving that dimension, and it's moving vertically, not horizontally. So this board will be much more stable, and it's you've taken away all the all the will for this piece to, to cup. All right, so that's how we're going to approach this. <coughs> I'm just going to demo quickly a way to go about, let's say you didn't have um, the two-inch material, but you had something like this. Like, I can make another pizza peel out of this. This is soft maple, curly soft maple. It's still pretty hard, but what I ended up wanting the... I wanted the flame birch because it's, it has a hardness on the Jenka hardness scale. If you want to nerd out sometime, look up the Jenka hardness scale, J-E-N-K-A. And that's some, some scientists, um, curious, um, figured out the pressure it took to press a steel ball, 0.444, uh, of an inch, so a little less than a half inch ball, right, in diameter, 0.444 diameter, how much pressure it takes to sink that hard steel ball half of its dimension. So as soon as it was buried halfway into the wood, they'd measure how much pressure was exerted. So the number for like white pine is in the hundreds, so the mid hundreds. Like, it doesn't take a lot of pounds of pressure to push that ball and crush white pine. But you start getting up to, like, um, uh, well, cherry and walnut around 950 on the Jenka hardness scale. So now you're up to 950 pounds of pressure. Um, and then you get up to, um, like, white oak is, I think it's 1260 or 1300, right around Red and white oak, red's a little softer than white, but they're right around 1250 to 1350 pounds, right? Birch is just below that, so it's, it's in the mid 1200s, I think. So the reason I'm telling you that is it's nice to have that reassurance that all the cutting that's going to go on on your board, it's going to handle it over time. It's not going to get trashed really quickly. So choose a good hard wood. And then also choose a, a wood that's not open grain. So you don't want a lot of porosity to it. You want it to look nice, and you don't want a lot of food and stuff to get in there and whatever. So something that's a closed grain wood, like maple, would be nice. Um, and uh, this soft maple would be nice, too, on the side. It's say, we say it's soft, but it's technically not that soft. It's harder than cherry, and uh, it's soft of the two maples, the main ones around here. <coughs> All right, so this, this is some, this was some 12 quarter material. So this was together like this, and this was a plank that was pretty wide, and I've, I used the other pieces, I forget, I think maybe for a pencil post bed or something like that. So this was a pretty wide plank, so all of that was gone. But the, it's plain sawn in this direction. So you can see the wider bands here. And on the edge, you see all that linear grain. And 
you see how that curl really pops. But if we look, if we look at the end grain, look at the end grain of this piece. So it's plain sawn this way, but look at the, the growth rings are running right across like that. Okay? So this is expanding and contracting this way. Now we're going to resaw this guy like this. And we can get three cuts in there at about a half an inch. Okay? Because we're going to have a board that's going to finish out at right about seven sixteenths of an inch thick. I'm guessing. <laughs> I'm guessing that's a good thickness. It just feels like three eighths, like a drawer bottom or a five six is a little floppy. But as you get to, and, and half inch was fine. You could do a half inch board too. Um, but I don't think you want it much more than that because it's going to be good size. And, and uh, the flame birch has good weight to it. So we don't want to, we don't want to kill the camera lady moving her uh, pizzas around. Right, so we want something Thank you. fairly light, strong, flat, non-porous, and the growth, growth rings going in the right way, all right? So, to get organized with this piece, I'm thinking I need, because this piece is two and three quarters, I'm gonna need seven of these to get a over my 18 inch width, because seven times three would give me 21, and then I lose seven quarters so I'm down to uh, 19 and a quarter all right so we're gonna end up with a little less than that by the time so we'll have 19 and then we'll cut our 18 inch round out of that I say you want an odd number because you want that center one is gonna be longer about six inches longer than the side pieces so that you can have a handle coming out the middle so we're gonna have the sides are gonna be 19 inches long and then we're going to get about 19 or 18, why 18 at least. And then our center one is going to be 25 long. So it can be, we can get our handle out of that, right? So there I've got, I chopped this one out already so we could get moving. That would be 19. And then I'll do another one here. At, that would be my second one at 19. But before I chop this apart, I can't forget my 25, right? So... I'm going to, I'll do a rip first here, a long one. I'm not going to do this one right now, but I'll do one long rip and I'll get my 25 out of that. And then I'll get two more rips out of here on the bandsaw. So we're going to end up with, oh, plenty of pieces, right? You're tempted to get more, but I couldn't figure out a way to get more than, uh, one board out of this one, just the way it was configured. All right, so I'm just going to demo cutting this one over at the bandsaw. So to resaw, bring it over here, and we're going to run it through. Here we go. I've got the fence set to a half an inch. Let's give it a shot. Now, one other thing I didn't mention was I, I pre-marked these with this V, and that's so I could put them back together and kind of orient them. And like this one, if I wanted to keep them all together, I'd make a separate mark like that. And then this one, I might make two marks, okay? So I could reassemble these after I've cut this apart and get my long one out first. 
So then once I have them all like this, let me just take three of these to explain. So I'd, I'd get all my strips out, but let's just work with three for now. And then I'll show you the flame birch that I've already prepped. What you've got is usually on the side grain, the grain is usually rising or falling. Now, and when I put these out and I lay them out like this, even though they're all from the same board, if I turned one around and I tried to get a joint like that, now I might have grain going down and then rising up because they're both following each other this way. This is the same orientation I can see there. So if I just lay them over like that, just kind of lay them flat, this is like a slip match. If, these, if this was veneer, you'd call it a slip match because you're just slipping them aside each other like that. You're not book matching where you open them like a page of the book. So anyway, this, by doing it in this method, if you have rising grain, it's, it's going to work out better if you keep them oriented this way. And then I, I would mark them all out. It's going to be better because the light can hit these boards and it's weird like even if you have we saw the exact same board if you have grain running uphill like that and you flip them around like that the lights gonna be hitting that one board it could be in the middle of your whole pizza serving board and that one's gonna be just reflecting darker if the light is going into the end grain and it's gonna be lighter when you're looking at it from the other way and you want uh, I want a more harmonious looking board. So keeping them in order helps uh, to keep things true that way. I know I'll be fine. So the grain is going to, nine times out of ten, it's going to match up great. And then I would order these all up. I'd get my whole thing set up, but I would just make, um, a, I could make a, a line like this. This is just showing me the direction. These are, I want to see all those marks at that end to keep things oriented. All right. Then I would go to the joiner. Now I'm going to join them and keeping in mind that that arrow is going to go first. So in joining the edges, sometimes your fence is not quite square. All right. Usually mine, I know it's good right now, but sometimes it gets out of square. And you're thinking, gosh, if I glue all these edge to edge, I want to end up with a good flat top of a table. Or in this case, we want a good flat serving board. So the trick is, let's say we're just focusing on this joint between these two here, OK? Between those two. I want that to be a really good joint. Now, I'm going to send this one through first. With, if I just use the arrow going that way and I send it through this way and let me just uh, I'm gonna go ahead and run this edge and then I'm gonna run the second one also with the arrow facing that way but look notice the arrow the second time is gonna be against the fence all right so here we go Okay, so let's say my, my fence is leaning that way. This, I'm going to really write it exaggerated. I would have cut like kind of an angle cut there when I went across. And then I ran my second one. And again, the fence is leaning that way. So I would have made an angle cut right on that one as well. Kind of like that, right? So if I've got a little bit of an angle on my fence, I'm going to hold these back the way I ran them through. When I bring the boards together, you see how the angle cut cancels each other out. So if there's a slight variation in your fence, and as long as you're running them in the same direction, you're going to clamp them up, 
and you're going to have a true flat, like 180 degree thing. So even if your fence is a little off, like 89 degrees, it ends up, the other cut is going to be 91. So no matter how you cut it, and you'll have a good, um, you'll end up with a 180 degree combination. Um, now, once I resawn, what it's nice to have is a sander like this one. It's a super max. I've shown you this before. 1632. It's pretty nice for th things like this where you can really dimension and flatten them nicely. And once I glue this up, I will run it through again and flatten any kind of discrepancy between them. All right. So I did one on the ones that I show you. I have 80 grit paper in there. I ran them through a couple passes. I didn't even have to rejoint them because they were pretty flat coming off of the bandsaw after resawing. And uh, every now and then, I would come over to the joiner, back to the earlier question, and then go back to the bandsaw if I felt like I was getting a little off of straight. But that's all. You don't have to really get fussy because you know you're going to flatten them if you, if you use the sander method, and then flatten them after you glue it up. All right, so let's go back to the bench. All right, so I am going to change gears and show you the flame birch batch. Now, these got mixed up a little bit, but look at the end grain there. So look at all these strips. We've got beautiful quarter sawn grain. That's going to be a nice, stable board. It doesn't want a cup or anything. Um, it's still moving more this dimension. Wood moves half as much radially, which is this way, like going radial to the growth rings. So we don't have to worry about movement anyway. The main thing we're trying to gain from the quarter sawn is the flatness properties. All right, so look, you can see my little arrows on there. I maintained all my arrows, and I laid these out, and I jointed them in succession, like I showed you just a minute ago. And I got them all. There's my middle one. I've got, so these were just, this is the, the flame birch. And these were sanded down. And I've got them to two inches wide. These were all jointed and kept in the same direction. And I've got everything nice. I kind of mixed them up so I, some of them like these two, I don't know if you can pick that up, but the grain is very similar. And I didn't want it to be so matchy-matchy right across with, because these might have been sawn right next to each other, where the curl or the flame is running the same. So I separated those two. Now, flame birch is a beautiful wood. It's, it's very similar to curly maple, except the curls are the more are wider, and they're, they're just these wider bands. So you have the dark curl, and I guess it, it looks almost like it's on fire. Um, when it gets the finish on it. So here we go. We've got this one all clamped together. I'm going to index the ends and get them together like that. So I, I've got 19 inch long pieces in the middle ones, 25. And across, I've got almost 18 and a quarter. So this is going to be perfect. All right. So let's uh, get a pencil and I'm going to mark this. So in case I get mixed up, I will be able to put it right back in position. Now that's also going to help me glue it up. Okay. So let's glue this up. We'll glue these. We know that edges are good. Oh, let me just show you one other quick technique. Here's a method. If you don't have a joiner, this, this method comes to you courtesy of Mike Pekovich. I saw him just do this the other day. It's pretty cool. It's just like using a, um, um, a shooting board, usually a shooting board, which I have over there, is used for end grain. But you can shoot the edges here too. So you would essentially lay them out the exact same way. And you need some way to hold the workpiece off, off the table. So all I've got here is really simple. I've got a piece of three quarter inch MDF, and I put a stop along the edge and a stop at the end. This is narrow enough that I'm overhanging by about an eighth of an inch. So let's say if this was my board, every one of these would get jointed. So you can take, like this, this is my long joiner plane, which doesn't come down much. I would use this because I, when I 
sharpen this, I keep it really straight. I don't have a camber on that blade. So this is because it's a joiner. Um, so this is perfect for this. Also, the, the miter plane I have gives a flat shot. But it doesn't even matter if it's dead square on this corner because you're going to get that same canceling effect I showed you at the joiner. So you'd get it on here like this and get it purchased here. Whoops, I should put, I could put another clamp down there, but I won't. Here we go. Ready? I'll just hold it stronger. So look at, we just, look at that. You're getting a nice shaving all the way down. Then we would flip. Again, you're going to keep all of the ends away from you like that. Hopefully we don't tear out. Oh, that feels good. Steve's asking about uh, grain direction on the shooting board. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not experiencing that. You would have to be concerned with that, but I've got this really honed nicely, and I'm getting a beautiful polished surface in both directions. So in this case, you really, if you want to get that cancellation factor for the angle, this is the way you want to do it. So I could have gone right through all my pieces like that. If you didn't have a joiner, you could use that way. It's pretty fun to go old school. But I was trying to just get them done faster. So we're in, we've got ourselves set up here. I'm actually going to use four clamps. I like these good old bar clamps because they, they're really straight and flat. They put great pressure and you can true up something like this quite easily. Now to glue it up, I'm just going to flip them up on edge like that. And I just need to glue one edge. I don't need the last one. So that's going to get glued up when I hit it. Let's get the bottle. Nice. I don't have a clog. Thank you. I think I'm going to do this just holding them like this. Okay, here we go. Just a good bead on there because we don't even have to smear this because we're going we're gonna to get a nice rub fit do want to make sure that you're going to have it fully covered. Using Type Bond 3, um, I was, con whoops, this one doesn't have to go the whole way because it's longer. <laughs> so I, um, I actually called the Type Bond technical people again <laughs> a number of times. I was curious about the heat resistance of type bond three like it's not going to get that much heat you know but you're going to put a hot pizza pie on there and wood is an insulator so it's not actually going to penetrate the full glue joint but i just was curious you know um, so they said that they tested type bond and three and the way they tested is they put it in a 150 degree oven overnight and then they test the strength again. So it normally, they said it loses two thirds of its strength overnight at 150 degrees. And its strength is 4,000 um, pounds pressure, like shear pressure at full strength. So you have over a thousand pounds still of shear strength after overnight at 150 degrees. So this is going to be fine for holding a pizza and not for <laughs> a few minutes. All right, so ready? I'm going to drop each one in now, and I'm going to do a rub fit. See how I get a nice little squeeze of glue out the top? I like to see that because I know I've got that out the bottom. But you want to see that little thin line. It's reassuring. Again, that rub fit, that just smears it completely. No need to do that grease up your finger method. I, I, don't, I don't get that. I'm, <laughs> I don't, you know how I am. I take really good care of my hands. I hate getting stain on them or anything like that. And match up my pencil mark as I go. And these are feeling nice. Hit 
we go. All right, pencil lines are good. I've got a little room to play with there. Now I'm going to come to the first one and bring it in. And I want to just make sure they're all sitting down nicely on there. They feel good. I feel all the seams feel really flush. Because they're not wide, they, they really behave well and they lay down nicely. You don't have to fight them or anything. Now I'm going to just snug that up. I'm going to bring another one in. This is a little overkill, but why not? I'll put one over the top. I mean, three would probably do, but let's, let's do this. Now this bar, what I like about them is they really align nicely. I, I forgot to look up the Bessie thing, but uh, my old Jurgensons were steel, and they would always make a black mark. Some of you probably have some of those on the stock when they get wet with the glue. And it was annoying, you know, if you didn't get it out of there. But um, these have some coating on them, and I don't get the black mark. So they're very well behaved. They're nice and flat. Actually, reversing your clamp like this is giving me the call pressure. So I've got one underneath. That's a good straight bar. And I'm not, they're not popping up at all. It's staying dead flat right on the call. And then you reverse them like this. And yeah, you get, you get this sandwich pressure from both sides. And that feels good. And then lastly, I'll put one more on the end. So now you can set it aside. Now what I like to do is let that glue firm up for about 20 or 30 minutes. And with a, with a putty knife, I'll just come along and it'll come right off easily. If it hardens up, you know, overnight, and you scrape that, those little pearls are so strong, they will tear out, pull a lot of tear out on the seam. So you could go after it with water right now. But if you, you can even set a timer for yourself so you don't forget. I waxed these, by the way, before I used them. So, yeah, see how I'm getting a really nice alignment. So, and they're not going to stain it because of that new coating. All right, so let's set this aside. And I'm going to bring in one that I've already got glued up. I'm going to just sort of shorten the recipe here. This could have been a two-nighter, but why not? Just have fun. You should leave it in there. They recommend at least 45 minutes, but I leave it in several hours all the time. Um, it reaches full strength properties app after like 24 hours. But uh, after, after half an hour, I, you can't pull those things apart. But um, <laughs> you don't want to stress it out. If it's a stress joint, then you definitely want to leave it in the clamps longer. But a simple edge to edge like this, there's very little pressure on there. So now I like to get some of that glue off. Jerry, no, we won't be giving any of these away. <laughs> <laughs> I need three. I need three of these. Uh, when no, we do pizza, we usually make a lot of it. So This would be an easy one to give away, though. Uh, that'll have to be. You know what's nice about this project, though? It's fast, and there's no moving parts. And it's kind of cool to have. Look at those. And this is, this is so flat. It just maintains flatness because of that grain direction. You flip it over, and there's my arrow. So this would have been my top, I was thinking. I'm just going to get a little of this off. We don't have pizza that often um, now with the kids living away from us. But it's just become a real go-to for me when we have people over because it's something I can do. I'm not great in the kitchen. You're awesome. Yeah, and everybody can put their own toppings on. It's kind of fun. I just want to show you this because this makes it so much easier. Do I have the, yeah. So this, of course, is 18 inches wide. This is a 1632. So it's open on one end. So I'm going to, you can run it through and then you turn it around to get that other swath. And it works out really fine. Let's just give it a shot.
We'll go one more. All right, back to the bench. I have 80 grit on there right now, and I'll just show you how I'd clean this up. I'd get it into my dogs here. What I was gonna say earlier about what's nice about this project is you can do it kind of fast and there's no moving parts. So unlike a table with a drawer, there's no parts to fit or anything like that. Now, I would have done this a little longer until the pencil line was gone and all the glue smears were gone, but we don't have time for that. So imagine it's all done, both sides. I would come back here, and the 80 grit is there. Now, this is something that I'm not going to try to be such a purist and hand plane. It's challenging. You're gonna, more than likely, you're going to get some tear out, unless your plane is really dialed in. And none of mine are perfectly set up for that right now anyway. And it's, it's this kind of project, it's better to sand. It's not necessary. So, but I would like to card scrape first to get me down there faster. So I'd set up my, my card scraper at least, get a good edge on it. And by doing this, you gain clarity and you can really see if there's any areas that a tear out or anything like that as you enter the sanding phase. But after just a few, see this is almost like shavings. Well, they are shavings, but it's not quite the same as hand planing, but this speeds up also the amount of time you'll spend sanding. But that looks pretty sweet. So I would hit both sides like that. Look at that shimmer. Doesn't it look like it's on fire? That's cool. That's the flame. All right. so. I would go ahead and hit both sides, and then I would start out with, you could start out with 150, because I had 80 grit there, in case you missed anything, and I would just. I went 150, then 220, and then I was ready to cut it into shape. I just like to do the sanding first so that I know getting near the edges isn't a problem. Like I didn't work the corners or anything. I know I'm cutting a circle. But to make my shape, I took a, uh, a compass and I set it up to nine inches and I made that circle, you know, right around. And then you can see what I did here. This is 18, 18 to there. And then I thought, okay, I got to transition to the handle. So I came over, I should have left that there, but I had an indexing point over here. And I just used like a radius of inch and three quarters to get that so it would blend right in. And then I just drew the handle up. Now, usually when you're doing um, a a pattern like this, whether it's a chair back, like a pierce splat, or something that's symmetrical, you only have to do one side. So you do the one side, and I had it drawn over here, but then when you come to draw it out, you'll set it onto your piece, and I'm just gonna get this inside here. I know this is the full two inches wide right there. I came right out to the edge there. That looks pretty good. And I gotta be inside my cut there. I've got some more room down here. I'll just move it down. Okay, I'm good up here. And then once it's in place, I'll just mark around. Let me get a pencil. This is pretty dull, but it's fine. I still gotta sand this, so I'm not being fussy about the so once I've gotten around there, see I've done my handle. Now I'm going to flip. Let's mark the center here. 
I'm going to put this, the circle right back in place there. And then I'm going to get it on the edge there. And I should see my circle reappear here, which I do. And my handle is right there. Now I'm going to just draw and reconnect it up here. You can see how by only drawing it on one side, you end up with a perfectly symmetrical handle. Okay, and I'm coming just inside there. Everything looks hunky-dory. So then I would uh, saw this out at the bandsaw. Let me just cut a little corner off because I don't want to ruin this one. But I would come to the bandsaw and I actually did it on the larger saw and sawed the smaller handle area on the smaller saw because I was getting a really nice finish off of the bigger saw as big as those teeth are. So let me just, I'm going to cut outside the line because I'm not ready to go there yet. come right in here. Then you can have a bandsaw line. Now, if you're making a lot of these, it'd be worth making a template and maybe you could route around. But only a few like this, I find it's easy to just saw and stay close to the line and then come back and put it in your vise after you've gone around. And you're going to use a block plane and tuned well, it will follow the curve. So you always want to do this with the grain. So I'd be hitting this one. So I'm going over that way. Let me show you this way. So you can see it better this way. So see how the grain is running out like that? So I want to come from behind it like that. So I'd, I'd run this one. If this was sawn round, I'd be running right around and then I'd run it over here. But I found that the block plane, you keep the nose down. Hear it hitting? After just a few passes, you'll see it get really clear, and you'll feel it, and you go, wow, that's, that's actually quite smooth. It takes away the ripples really well. It's crazy, because it's a flat plane. You wouldn't think it would handle curves well, but it handles a convex curve like this really well. You'd have to have something else like the spoke shave for the concave. But just by that, and that, that smooths it up, and it gets it ready for putting a little radius on there. Now, I would go all around here, in here. You'd have to get out some files, maybe. Um, what I like to use is uh, one of these sanders. I use these in here. Just for those tight corners. Right in the drill, you can use a sander. You can also use an oscill oscillating um, drum sander. Those work well if you got one. But I got by with a drill like that for years, and I still, I still go to it a lot for something like that. All right, so once you've got, imagine now, imagine that this is all beautifully finished off and smooth. And it's glossy. looks great. Now, to radius or not to radius? That's the question. I, I like a little soft radius on this because you're gonna, the whole thing is going to have that hard edge look. We don't want that. We want a little friendlier edge, and we want the handle to have a little less edginess and a little roundedness to it. So what I like to use is, you know, I usually use a profile, like a roundover. In this case, I've got a uh, 3 16 roundover in there. But I don't even have it all the way out. So you leave a little flat in the middle. And I usually don't use the full curve of a round over because I like to still leave an edge on the top, not one of those soft into nothing. I just feel like it looks a little classier to retain a little edge instead of it being a smear right into the surface, OK? So I just hold it like this. And if this were all done, and we had time, I would route the whole thing. But I'll just show you how I do this. The router bit is spinning clockwise as I look down on it. 
clockwise. So I'm going to be cutting from the left side right here. The, I want to be, the bit is going to be going nicely with the grain here. It's going to be circling in. When I go to the other side, now I'm circling into the teeth of the grain. So what I want to do is actually start from the other direction and make what's called a climb cut. So by sneaking up behind the grain like this, when, you're, when the bit is cutting into the grain, you leave a smoother surface than if I was just to push it into it like that. I'm going to come back. Now, you've got to be careful climb cutting because if you're taking too much material off, that router wants to jump. But here, I'm just taking that small little thing, and with one hand, I can easily control it. Famous last words. <laughs> here we go. So that's how I treat the entire edge. And see how we've got a nice radius, but we've left a flat in the middle. So before I would sand that edge, I find it's really helpful to speed up the process. If you come with a card scraper and going with the direction of the grain, I'm going to just card scrape away some of that harsh cut from the router bit. If you've got any burn marks, you can scrape them right out, too. You shouldn't have burn marks if your bit is sharp enough and, and you're moving along. All right, so it takes a few minutes, but look at now. Now the radius looks complete, even though I didn't get the full radius. So you see how it's not the full thing. It's, it's sort of like that pillowing thing I showed you before. Well, you have a subtle kind of radius, but you notice we've still got an edge to the top, but it's a nice softened edge. It's quite different from that, isn't it? Then I would final sand it, or just take a, I like using 150 grit on the edge after I've card scraped it. Let's put it back on the vise. <laughs> see that because we use the card scraper it takes no time at all to get a nice polished I got it better on this side look at you want to sand to clear so you don't see any whiteness like there's a little white streak there I need to sand a little more there but you can with 150 grit and a, a little palm sander like that it contours to the curve and quickly sands it beautifully then I would come back with a 220 grit and I just would break these edges a little bit. And in here, you have to hand sand a little to get that radius because you're not going to get in there with the sander and smooth it out. Now, I did that with one earlier. Let me show it to you. Woohoo! Here it is. How about that? This is our pizza peel, a pizza cotta serving to tray. Wow. Look at, check out that awesome. edge. Isn't that silky? And we still cut a little defined edge there, but it's much friendlier to the touch. And we've got almost the full 18-inch diameter because of the radius we lost That's a little. awesome. But look how beautiful that is. All right, so we've got it all finished like this now, and we want to put some kind of protective finish on there, but we want it to be food friendly. So I'm going to put on here just what I would put on a cutting board, and that's just straight mineral oil. It soaks in and it repels somewhat the water. You're never going to soak this anyway. It's just a serving tray board. So let's see what happens. So this has been nicely sanded to 220. Edge is broken. Everything's clear. I'm just going to put a little on here and see what happens. Oh, the chatoyance. Let's let it. It's going to soak in, which is cool. Wow, this is almost too pretty for. <laughs> but it's nice. I mean, look at, oh my gosh. Are you getting that, Chatoyance? Yep. Is that crazy or what? 
Gorgeous. So this will really soak in, and you got to leave it on there amply. Look at the edge. Sweet. So we'll get that. Feel that. It's hard, but that quarter song grain, gosh, look at That's intense. It looks like quilted because of the way it's all put together, but that's a beautiful flame birch board. And... What a nice server. Now, you, do, you don't have to do it just for pizza. You could do this other kinds of serving trays. You could use the same technique with the, uh, the courtesan method, ripping up. Like I said, a piece six inches wide, five feet long, eight quarter, will make three of these. So, pretty nice. I've got pretty lots easy. of questions, I think. Lots of questions. Okay, um, I'm ready. Rick is saying, I get a lot of burn marks with my drum sander. Is there a trick to installing the sanding strip? I throw a lot of my sandpaper away. Ooh. Uh, I think you'll find the burn marks, usually it's some kind of pitch. Or uh, that one has a pressure sensitive switch. So if you're trying to do too much, what it is, it's, the, it's heat on the drum. The drums, when you're, when you're right flat on a drum like that, you do have heat problems. So you can't take too much off. And usually, you're going to confront burn problems at the finer grits. But when you use an 80 grit like that, you're not taking too much of a cut. You're not going to experience any, any burning. But um, it's mainly, yeah, it's the amount of cut and keeping the paper clean. Sometimes cherry, woods that have pitch in them, will burn more readily, and once they get some pitch on the paper, it kind of messes it up. Look at this side. It's already soaked in. So I'm going to just keep going over it until I get sort of to a saturation point, and that's going to protect this nicely enough. Then it gets really kind of dry looking, but it, it still it looks like it's got a minimal finish. I use the same thing on cutting boards and like rolling pins. Wow, this thing is vibrant. That's the thing about wood. It just comes alive when you hit it. And it's really varied on the surface, so I don't see the repeating pattern, but because I spread them out, like this, these two are just alike, and they're like those, but they're spread out enough. So I'm going to let this dry in there and then wipe it dry, and that'll be good. All right, thanks so much for being here. I'll see you next time on Shop Night Live.